welcome to the Kolkata launch of India Grows at Night. We are most appreciative of IMI hosting us here at their beautiful campus. I'm sure all of you will agree. I remember vividly how about a couple of years ago, um, Mr. Gurcharan Das had engaged a large audience in Kolkata at an interactive session organized by Aspen India um, on his much acclaimed book, The Difficulty of Being Good on the Subtle Art of Dharma. It was a full house then, much like it is this evening, so thank you for being here. His earlier book, India Unbound, has, was an international bestseller published in many languages and filmed by BBC. After an early retirement from Procter & Gamble in 95, Mr. Das became a full-time writer and columnist with several literary works to his name. This evening, in making a liberal case for a strong state, he will be in conversation with Dr. Rudrangshu Mukherjee, currently the opinions editor, editorial pages of The Telegraph. Dr. Mukherjee needs little introduction in Kolkata a distinguished speaker, known, a known face in literary circles, a respected historian, and an author of several books. Both columnists and authors have much in common, certainly respect for each other. Uh, both through their writings, they make us think and reflect. And more importantly, both are thought leaders in intellectuals with high values. This evening was going to be chaired by Mr. Sanjeev Goenka, uh, Chairman R.P. Sanjeev Goenka Group and Trustee of Aspen Institute India. Unfortunately, Mr. Goenka is unable to join us this evening due to the loss of a very dear close family friend. He did, however, request us to read out a personal message from him, which I shall do now. I sincerely apologize for not being able to make it to the event which I have been looking forward to attending for quite some time. I realize with great regret that I'll be missing out on the opportunity to interact with two of my most admired columnists. On behalf of the RP Sanjeev Gonka Group and Aspen India, I'd like to congratulate Mr. Gurcharan Das on the release of his new book, India Grows at Night which I am certain will find wide and devoted readership. I'd also like to thank Mr. Das for sharing his well-informed views on a subject that is both fascinating and topical. We are indeed fortunate and thankful that Dr. Ruth Rangshu Mukherjee, an accomplished author and one of the finest commentators of Indian history, is a part of the panel discussion as well. Finally, I'd like to thank Mohit Kampani the CEO of Spencer's Retail, for agreeing to fill in for me at such short notice. A remarkably articulate and astute speaker, Mohit will bring immense value and perspective to this evening. <coughs> Mr. Mohit Kampani, we are most appreciative of you filling in for Mr. Goenka this evening. Appreciate you being here with us. Uh, Mr. Mohit Kampani took over recently as the CEO of Spencer Retail and has been with the group since 2007. So ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mohit Kampani, Dr. Rudrangshu Mukherjee, and Mr. Gurcharan Das. Or some of us have that kind of discipline to write for six hours every day. 
uh, there is a story that, not a story, the anecdote that Graham Greene, irrespective of what he did the previous night, and you can well imagine what Graham Greene was up to <laughs> given his reputation, uh, every day, and irrespective of where he was, every day before breakfast he wrote 500 words. And as long as he was alive, he did that. And so there is something to emulate. I mean. Well, you have to play some tricks with yourself. Uh, as I was telling you, for example, never read the newspaper in the morning. <laughs> never answer phone calls in the morning. Never look at email in the morning. And never talk to anybody, including your wife, in the morning. <laughs> And poor thing, she's got used to. <laughs> you got used to the fact that there's somebody there in the room next door to whom she can't talk, and and uh, and only if there's a fire, or I suppose, anything in the house <laughs> that uh, you interrupt the routine. So, India grows at night while Gurcharan Das writes during the day. <laughs> but I. I actually want to go straight into the <coughs> principal pillar of the argument that you're making in this book, which uh, I'm a bit uneasy, so I'll start with that. That is how, as a self-confessed liberal, you can actually advocate a strong state. Right. Well, that's a very good question, because I think that's easily the uh, one we should get out of the way yes. first that uh, by a strong state, I do not mean a state like Mao, China, or Stalin's Russia, or Hitler's Germany. Uh, certainly these were not liberal states. Uh, the strong state, maybe the better word should have been uh, effective state, I think, in this context. But the strong state was a word that was used by the 18th century thinkers who f did the first thinking on the modern uh, in the Enlightenment period, uh, the, the modern state, and the thinking that really created the first modern uh, liberal state, which was the United States of, of America. And the words that were used by the thinkers in the Federalist Papers, for example, uh, Jefferson, Hamilton, uh, and so on, uh, this was the notion that, that a liberal state has three pillars, and one of the three pillars is an executive. In fact, the reason for the existence of the state is its ability to act. And so it should be capable of quick, determined, decisive action when required. That action, second pillar, is that action should be bounded by the rule of law. And the third pillar is that action should be accountable to the people. But also, the liberal state assumes that the state is only a night watchman. Well, yes, but you know, I think that they wanted... Wasn't that Mill's phrase? That was, yes, that, we, that was a phrase used. And but there was a fair amount of richness of debate at the time. And the concern, for example, the debate in the United States at that time was that they didn't want the president to be too strong. They didn't want to have another George, King George. So they wanted to, to they wanted him to be accountable and uh, uh, bounded by the rule of law. But also, they wanted also to be very clear that he had plenty of potential power. So the president of the United States had they had from the beginning plenty of potential power. You know the the the. the the, the classical dilemma, and, and is today, that for us in India, not only in, in the Indian democracy, but other democracies also face the same problems. That, and it's not a new one, that uh, the Indian state has become weak. We think it may be because of a weak prime minister, uh, or the gridlock we, uh, in the parliament, or the coalition, nature of coalition politics. I mean, it was humiliating for a lot of Indians to see our Prime Minister 
constantly humiliated by Mamata Banerjee, week after week. I mean, we just, uh, it, was, it was just too sad, you know. And, and the question really is, why should it take a rogue? Why should it take us 12 years to build a rogue when it takes three or four anywhere else? Why should it take us 12, 15 years to get justice? And that's really the weakness of the executive. Yeah, but there are two, if I may say so, there are two separate issues here. One is this weak state in the way that you defined it in the first instance, a weak prime minister, coalition government, gridlock of so and so, means that it is a contextual statement. If we can remove these contexts, the state may not remain weak. So, but the second is a more systemic. Uh, problem that you're upholding. So is the Indian state weak in terms of the system, or is the Indian state weak in terms of the personnel and the context it finds itself at the present conjuncture? It's a very good question. And I think it's a bit of both. That, um, you know, the mistake we make is to think, as I said, that the state has become weak only now. But Really, the, in my view, the Indian state has always been weak, whereas it has been a, we, India has had a strong society, unlike China, which has had a strong state and a weak society. We, and therefore, the history of India was a history of competing kingdoms, whereas the history of China was the history of empires. And the Indian was always defined by society and the Chinese was defined by the state. And in India, the, uh, in, in China, the emperor gave the law and then interpreted the law. In India, the law was prior to the king and the job of the king, dharma, was to uphold dharma. And very early on, a division of powers was created because the interpreter of the law was not the king, but the Brahmin. And also, oppression in India did not come from the state. It came from society. And the answer to that oppression, of course, was the Buddha, or a spiritual entrepreneur who came along and <coughs> liberated the flock from the sort of tyranny of the Brahmins, <coughs> or the tyranny of the cousins. And, and so it's not surprising, this finished point that I've gone through, it's not surprising that India, after independence, became a democracy. In a sense, you could argue without pluralism that we could only have been a democracy. And therefore, India today is rising from below. Unlike China, which is a top-down success, we are a bottom-down success. And that's what gives rise to this phrase, India growth at Yes, of course. No, but you know, uh, the statement that the Indian state has always been weak uh, because competing multiple kingdoms assumes that only a centralized state is strong. But within these kingdoms, many of these kingdoms were actually very strong kingdoms. Yes. Even though they were regional entities. Yes. Yes. And of course, the bigger counterexample is the Mughal state was a centralized state. It was certainly not a weak state. Yeah, but and certainly not a non-oppressive state. Right. But, uh, I mean, I, looking at the Mughal state, but even we say, let's, the we had four empires. Yes. You had Mauryas, you had Guptas, you had the Mughals, and you had the British. But when I compare these empires with Ramshu, with the Chinese empire, they appear weak. Even the Mughal empire did not have the kind of the bureaucratic control on society that was exercised by the Chinese emperors. And so I just think, well, that's, I mean, it's, it's, it's not to suggest that, I'm not suggesting that history is destiny, that we are destined to be a weak state. But I do think that it's good to understand who, and you know, it's so nice to be talking to a historian, because it's, 
nice to know who we are. And um, my sense is that both India and China were people, were people by migrations from Central Asia. In China, those migrations led to a unified Han identity. Whereas in India, we accumulated those, uh, our migrants, like the Kushanas, and the, we, we, had a, we have a Rajput, we have 2,200 subcastes. And so we are accumulators, and the Chinese are assimilators. So if the Chinese are like a soup, we are like a biryani, in which you can see the, <laughs> the separate <laughs> grains of rice. The separate grains, exactly. So I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but I'm just suggesting that um, you, you raised the question of institutions. Is it an institutional failure in our constitution, or is it a problem of having the immediate context of the coalition governments and uh, maybe a weak prime minister or whatever. Well, you know, in a sense, uh, and with this, I, I'm, I'm not answering your question immediately, but I'm trying to understand this whole situation as we are talking, um, that uh, we are now, you know, states since the coalition politics started, the states have become a lot more powerful. I mean, these the chief ministers of our states are like presidents, you know. And uh, and this is really, we are in a sense returning true to form with the competing kingdoms. And you're right that some of the uh, our kingdoms, the Eastern Chalukyas, yes. the Cholas, were very powerful kingdoms. And just as today, we have very powerful chief ministers who run the show. And sometimes one wonders how liberal they are. Yeah. And, and uh, so we did build a system of check and powers, check and balance in our, in our constitution, uh, as did the Americans. And Obama also has been a weak president. I mean, he hasn't been able to solve the main the main issue in America today is the issue of the deficit. You know, and either you will have to cut expenditure or raise taxes. And they have not been able to do either. And this problem has been going on for so long. And, and he feels helpless. And every few years you have this fiscal cliff that they talk about. So there's a weak. That some of the European states are weak because they, their main problem is the cost of health care. They haven't been able to come to grips. So it, we are not unique in that respect, but we are unique in the failure of governance, the day-to-day -day governance uh, that we face. So I'm not sure there's an easy answer to the question you've raised. I think it's a bit of both. That we had a strong uh, leader in the center, Indira Gandhi. Nobody could have said that's a weak leader. But she was not an institution builder. I mean, my point is for a liberal state, she was not liberal. She had very strong illiberal tendencies. And some would say she was a destroyer of institutions rather than a builder of institutions. And our need, why I'm making a liberal case for a strong state, is because our need today is not for a strong leader like uh, Narendra Modi to come in there and take us to glory, but we have a need to of an institution who will do the difficult job of reform of the police, the judiciary, the bureaucracy, and and that's that's how you create a strong state. A strong state doesn't. No. A strong state does not tolerate corruption. So, I have sort of one quip, uh, taking over from the great who guard, great quote about who guards the guards. <laughs> who reforms the politicians? Yeah, and that's 
So the question is, how do you make these reforms take place? It's in a democratic setup a where you're electing people who yeah. are actually going to institute the laws. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is the central question uh, that I confront here in this book. Um, if we are lucky, we could have a strong leader who's also reform. But in a in democracy, you can't guarantee that. And so I think the next best uh, solution, for in my view, the next hope, uh, and, and let me just say before I give you that hope, that other democracies have faced this problem and they have been able to throw up leaders who did the reforms. I mean, as you know very well, better than anybody else, that early 19th century England was very corrupt. You could buy a seat in parliament, you could uh, buy any job in the government, but the English threw up the kind of political leaders uh, who did the reforms, and you had the Reform Acts. And then you had Disraeli and Gladstone and all who pushed this whole thing forward. And in this century, uh, Margaret Thatcher, we may not agree with her ideology, but she did, she made the government of the UK far more accountable than it, I mean, than it was. And so, you do, uh, dem democracies can uh, throw it up. But since we are compressing history, in England took 150 years to do this. And we are trying to compress history just like growth. The Industrial Revolution, over 150 years. It was an average 3% growth rate. So there's we a have short to go circuit ahead. problem here. There's a short circuit problem. We have to go back to 8% growth very quickly. And we, we've hit a wall right now. And, uh, and it's partly governance. Why they've hit a wall? Not the, I mean, more than economic reforms today, we need the reforms of, of governance. So, what I was trying to say is that the last 20 years in our country have resulted in the coming up of a generation of Half the in people in India are young and they never knew an unreformed India. This bunch of people, this is the group uh, you remember I wrote about in India and yeah. Yeah. that boy Raju, that's what he's called. And this, these people's, when Manmohan Singh was doing the reform, he didn't ri realize he was liberating the, and decolonizing the minds of the young. And so these people, today have risen and they have risen by their book bootstraps as the Americans say. And they see the, that their results of their success is because of the work, the hard work they put in. And they see on the other side of the road the state where these guys travel in these cars with their flashing lights and then they get to their office and they make you wait hours to get the job, whatever you need from them. And they see a mismatch. And so what you have is this, a new, you can call it a new middle class or whatever, but this group of people, this aspiration of India, is now about a third, quarter to third of India. And we, if we do our 8% growth, there will be a half of India. China, they're already half. And India too, they'll be half in about a decade. And these people are impatient. And there's a huge demand for reform. Now reforms occur when there's a demand for reform. When politicians, so for me, the lesson of the Anna Azare movement or Nirbhaya is that this is an assertion of this class. Because they have, this is the only voice they have found. Uh, in, 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 in politics. And this is why this is not going to go away. After Nirbhaya, there's going to be another outrage. And 
and then another one. And so the difference the politicians, I think, are beginning to get is that they thought, I mean, the fact is this young group of people that I'm talking about, they have no one to vote for. And I asked them, because of this book now, I've advocated you know, a new political party, uh, the, the dialogue that I have with the young people, they say we, we have no one to vote for in 2014. Because they say every party is a party of grievance. The Congress party says, oh, you poor fellow, you lost out in liberalization, globalization. So we have to give you free power, free half-price diesel, we have to give you Nariga jobs, and so on. The BJP says, oh, you poor fellow, you're a victim of a thousand years of Muslim rule. The caste party says, oh, you poor fellow, you're a victim of caste, upper caste oppression. So everybody is treating this group like a victim, whereas this is an aspirational group. And so I think it is this, I mean, that's where kind of I'm placing my faith in this middle class, because they, with a backed by a media, a Supreme Court, etc., they've been able to taste some success. We've never had so many people go to jail as we have in the last five years. Actually, it started with Jessica Lal when this first assertion through social media started, through SMSs and, and Facebook and so on. So, I personally think that they are a force for the good. Now, you know, but at the same time, I recognize, as I said in this book, that middle class is not necessarily benign. But middle class makes history. And all the revolutions were created by the middle class. Because the quintessential middle class was the Weimar Republic middle class. And that led to so, it's not necessarily that middle class is a benefit. But so far, this middle class has acted for in the cause of good governance. Because, and the difference is that politicians are so used to giving goods to sections of the population. They're used to giving free power to certain groups, reservations to certain groups. Um, the Riga jobs to certain groups, that they've forgotten that the, they've forgotten the lesson of Nirvaya is they've forgotten public goods. A law and order helps everybody in society, not just the section. And so maybe this middle class will be heard now. I mean the reaction to Nirvaya uh, uh, right now is is quite <laughs> amazing. Uh, just as what, uh, uh, and so I mean, much even much more stronger than even the low power uh, demand. And um, so I mean, that's kind of where I feel that the hope may lie in this group becoming. But but of course they don't. They need now the hard work begins because protests will only take you so far. Protests will awaken a society, but protests do not solve the problem. That is the work, hard work of politics. So we have to actually make politics a respectable uh, thing. And in, in, in this book, I uh, actually quote, give the example from Tocqueville. Uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, those of you who may not know, was, wrote perhaps the greatest book on democracy called Democracy in America. And this was 150, 200 years ago when he visited America. And he was telling the Europeans that what makes Americans successful, the American democracy, America was the, own, was the first democracy. What makes it successful is the fact that the people, the Americans, have the habits of the heart. And by the habits of the heart, what he was talking about was the fact that they engaged in the neighborhood. And so my advice to this young people is one hour a week. That's how you begin politics. One hour a week you spend in your neighborhood talking about, worrying about the 
condition of the schools, the roads, the lights, the garbage collection, and to get engaged in, 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 in the neighborhood. And that's where you learn the idea of, I mean, worry about the corruption in your neighborhood rather than worrying about Robert Badra and, and, and so on. And, and, and so uh, I think that's at least one uh, area that I think should engage. And of course, because, uh, you know, I mean, since none of the existing parties satisfy this group of aspirers, you would have thought that the Aam Admi Party, Kedriwal, might be the answer. But unfortunately, the Aam Admi Party could have been this party that would have brought these people. Unfortunately, it has, it, uh, the group has shown just too many illiberal tendencies. I mean, the kind of Lokpal they wanted was a super kind of bureaucrat who would control the kind of power that we have, which would not be liberal. And plus, I think I certainly worry about some of the people around K. Driwal and himself, that whether they really believe in economic reform. I mean, the fact of the matter is, we could have our existing parties become more liberal. And why do people believe that economic reform is about the rich getting richer? And the fact, the reason is that they believe, uh, because nobody has explained, and this is a great failure of our reformers, uh, that they have not explained the difference between being pro-market and pro-business. Pro-market means that you stand for a rules-based capitalism. You stand for competition, which, which lowers your cost, raises the quality, and helps everybody in society, including the poor. Being pro-business is really about allowing still discretion in the hands of politicians and bureaucrats, which exists still in the unreformed sector of our society, like mining and real estate. And that leads to crony capital. And that's why people get the impression, oh, it's about liberalization, is about crony capital. But it's not. Now, that is the kind of job that I would like this liberal party to, to do. Uh, Allow me to force you to ponder two paradoxes, somewhat related. Weak state, if we keep aside the 18 months of the emergency, it is under this weak state in various garbs that we have had the largest number of infringements of individual liberties and freedoms. That's one paradox. Weak Prime Minister, who in his avatar as a Finance Minister, under a very weak Prime Minister who didn't even command a majority in Parliament, carried out the most effective set of reforms India has seen since 1947. Right. How do you resolve these two? That's very, very good question. I think only you would have come up with a question like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. I mean. Life is full of paradoxes and history is full of paradoxes. But you're absolutely right that that weak government of Narasimha Rao made the reforms happen and transform India forever. And it's very odd, you know, Rudrangshu, uh, because in my in Indian Bound, I have a conversation with Narasimha Rao as well as a conversation with. Uh, my mom's state. And, uh, and I um, am telling Narasimha Rao at that time, this is after the, after he's out of power, <coughs> he's no longer in power. And I'm raising questions and saying, I, you know, first my starting point is to kind of flatter him and say, you are the Deng, uh, what uh, Deng was to China. He said, no, 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 I'm a humble servant of the Congress party, humble servant of the Gandhi family. That's what he said, Nehru Gandhi, humble servant. He always mentioned that. Yeah. 
<laughs> and yet, I, I'm now convinced uh, the reforms happen not because of one more thing, but because of the support, the very quiet but determined support that uh, But there was something else happening at that time. And this may explain why a weak state behaved like a strong state that the principal secretary to the Prime Minister was a man called Amarnath Baron. Now, this person had been a very senior civil servant. He had been secretary, industry, secretary, <coughs> commerce before that. And he was convinced of the need for reforms at the time. But he was a tough guy. And so, Narsimha Rao, said to him, look, we have to, because we were facing a crisis, we had to do certain reforms, not only to satisfy the IMF, the World Bank, but also to just get things going. So, while the message was clear to the, the there was Chidambaram in commerce, there was Manmohan Singh in finance, but it was Amarnath Varma who, with the name, the name of the Prime Minister, created a committee of 11 secretaries of the economic ministries in their civil aviation, commerce, and so on. And uh, they used to meet every Thursday for one hour, from 10 to 11. And Montague says that Amarnath Varma was a terror meaning he would, not, he would lock the door and you were not even allowed to use, go to the bathroom. And you were certainly not allowed to be absent because your name would be, in, you would be informed to the Prime Minister what, that you were absent. So this was a committee, it was very unusual in the government, for a one hour meeting every Thursday, which went on for two years. And they, so that each, the idea of this meeting was, that you, each ministry was supposed to present one reform at this meeting. So for example, the civil aviation ministry presented the reform, which was not to privatize Air India, but uh, to allow competition of the private airlines, that they would open the skies so that airlines like Jet Airways would come in. And the format of this meeting was that you, the ministry, the first 10 minutes, the ministry presented, the secretary presented the reform. Uh, the others then debated the reform for the next 40 minutes. And in the last 10 minutes, Varma summarized the sense of the meeting. And then he sat down in the next five minutes and wrote down the minutes of the meeting himself in the form of three, four line maximum paragraph. He took it immediately to the Prime Minister, got his signature, took it to the cabinet at five o'clock. Every Thursday they'd have a cabinet meeting. <coughs> and by seven o'clock they had a press note ready. And Friday mornings, I don't know if you read, you read the newspapers, every Friday was like Diwali. We had a reform, Economic Times, <laughs> reading the economic business, business standard. <laughs> business standard. It was really amazing how. Now, if you ask me, in the last eight years of the UPA government, why would they? You know, uh, why would we have we been paralyzed into this weak, this weakness, which has so diminished, but brought down our growth rate? from 8% to 5.5%. You know, one percentage point is 1.5 million direct jobs and 4.5 million indirect jobs. And we have dropped three percentage points. And each so you job... you don't relate the drop in economic growth in, uh, to the global slowdown, but to 
and absence of the weakness of governance? Well, yeah, I think it's a combination. I mean, it would be simplistic to say, yes, there's, obviously there's a national situation as when your, mar when your markets, your export markets are weak. But India is still a country which is driven by the domestic economy and by the consumption rather than by uh, production. And so we have suffered far more from high interest rates. We have suffered far more from where in, you know, our savings rate is still above 30, but our investment rate is falling. And so the people, the, the, the paralysis, I mean, the other day Ratan Tata expressed it. Uh, when he was anguished, he said, you know, you asked me, there was an interview with Financial mm -hmm. Times, where uh, James Crabtree was asking him, about this, and he said, you know, you're saying, why are you investing abroad so much? He says, in my own country, I've been waiting eight years for permission to start a steel plant. Mm -hmm. So what do I do? We keep waiting. So this is, I think, part of the problem of the weak. Uh, that, uh, but that's the contextual point mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're making. You didn't answer the first paradox. Which was? Which was weak state infringement, maximum number of infringement of individual liberties. Right, right. It's very important because... No, no, it's a very, very important question because a liberal state upholds individual liberties. I mean, liberty is, the, is more important than equality yes. in a liberal state. And... and so, I mean, Indira Gandhi dismissed 57 properly elected governments during her, during her period for president's yeah. rule. So, I was keeping aside those uh, 18 months aside, but yeah. you look at the, just, just the present uh, five years, four or five years. Yeah. So, you have this paradox in a way, you know, Nainan expressed it rather well, where he said that Indian state is weak for the strong and strong for the weak. That if you are a weak person, you confront a kind of callous bureaucracy which suggests the strong state. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the strong state never tolerates corruption. It doesn't let 15 years pass before it gives you judgment in the courts. So the Chinese state, the Chinese economy is very corrupt. Mm -hmm. so you couldn't have a stronger state than China. Yeah, the kind of corruption in the Chinese state is, it, 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 it's a very good point, you know, it's a very good point. The Chinese here is the strongest state in the world today. And the, 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 the lesson of, of liberal, liberal democracy is well, the lesson from Rajat Gupta's trial in New York was in two years, they investigated, they separated charges, they had a trial, convicted. and they had sent the conviction, they sent them sentence. Mm -hmm. And you say, because it's really the certainty of conviction that deters a criminal far more than the amount of punishment. So you're right. I mean, the Chinese state is an illiberal state. The kind of corruption, though, that uh, it tolerates, I guess, is a different kind that is uh, that does not harm the process of growth uh, as our corruption does. But their corruption is a corruption of uh, of, 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 of people who are seeking voice in the case of, of uh, they, they are it. I'll, I'll give you an example of Chinese corruption. I have a very good friend who in, who's a Chinese, and he invests in India. So, and he comes to my house once in a while, and I think one of the reasons why he comes around is he's looking for stock tips. Mm. And he hasn't come for the last few months because he thinks I've been giving him bad tips. <laughs> Um, so he is an extraordinary fellow. He made enormous amount of money in a distant province of China. 
and then discovered that he, I mean, he had not shared, he made $250 million, but he did not share it with the party bosses. When they discovered that he made that kind of money, they went after him. So he saw that his life was in danger. But he was clever. The one step ahead, he spirited out that money overnight out of China. And then he spirited himself out. So he lands up in Hong Kong. <clears throat> Within a week, they are after him in Hong Kong. And he believes they are assassins. And so he runs away to Canada. In Canada, in Canada, within a couple, you know, if you arrive with $250 million, you get residence immediately. <laughs> so he becomes a resident of Canada. But within a month, those people are behind him in Canada, and his life is not safe. So he quietly walks down to California. I mean, he goes, not walks down, yeah. he drives down to California, in the U.S. also. If you've got that kind of money, you get a green card very quickly. So he gets a green card and he's living in Canada. And then within a few months, he discovers that he's, no, he's not safe in California. And he finally, again, leaves, lands up in Singapore. And for the first time, he breathes easy. It's Singapore. It's a tribute to Singapore's governance that they have not dared to get near him. Singapore. Anyway, he invests all his money now in India because he thinks this is the place to really make money. And one day he came home to my uh, came to my house and he had a backache. I said, "What's the problem?" He says, "Your roads." He says, "I've just been to Haryana to visit some factories because I was thinking of investing." In how did you become the second fastest growing economy in the world with this kind of infrastructure? So I told him India grows at night when the government sleeps. <laughs> and so he thought for a few minutes and then he said, you mean India has risen with one hand tied? And I nodded. And he thought some more. And then he said, you know, the nightmare of the Chinese leadership will be, what if that second hand got untied? Interesting thought. And you know, so, I mean, I feel the mistake we make when we think of India and China is that they, we think of a race, and very simplistically we believe that the race is who will, who will get rich first. Well, Chinese are 10 years ahead. And frankly, um, both countries will turn into middle class countries. They'll both become middle income countries. So if we get back to our 8% growth, which I think we will, um, despite the governance, that you'll we'll get to about five, six thousand, six thousand dollars by 2030. China will be about twelve thousand dollars, ten to twelve. But both Indians and Chinese believe that their destiny is to have a per capita income of $40,000, which is the U.S. per capita income. But that's not going to happen. Because the race is who will pick. If China fixes its politics first before India fixes its governance, China will win the race. But if, as, what is likely is that both will not fix their problems and both will get stuck in the middle income trap. One last provocation. We are running out of time. Do you, do you seriously believe India is growing with undernourishment and ab absolute poverty so much manifest all over the people. We are actually, all this while, we have been talking about an urban population. What's happening out there in rural India? Well, that's a very legitimate question. And certainly, I would say that I'd make two observations. One is, 
that you know Suresh Tendulkar used to say Suresh Tendulkar was the great writer on poverty, you know, on the economist on poverty in India. And one thing Suresh Tendulkar said, yes, we have a lot of poor people. But for the last 25 years, he sort of measuring from 1985 when Rajiv Gandhi came in, that 1% of the poor have been crossing the poverty line every year. Now if you accumulate that, your about 250 million people have crossed the poverty line in this time. Not as much as China. China almost 400 million people have crossed the poverty line. And that's the difference of the 2% growth rate. So actually, you're right, the number of poor are still about a third of India or a quarter, quarter of India. Our overall population at the same time has grown. But the model of growth we had before 1985 or before 1991 was a model of growth that did not do very much for the poor either. In fact, the number of poor between 1950 and 1980, when our growth rate was 3.5%, 1980 is a good dividing point because it was 6% average. And of course, last decade has been 7% average. So if you take this uh, fact that for the first 30 years of our republic, then, then we did not make a dent on poverty, despite Garibi Hatao and all the things that we had. So, in what, what bothers people like well, you and me is that inequality has grown. Now Kuznets famously explained this, that when growth begins in any society, the, the inequalities in, increase. But if you measure over a 30, 40 year period, then the lowest 20% grow at the same rate as the whole now the exception, the exception to this has been the United States, where actually uh, it has not happened since the 70s, 30, 70s. But by and large, in, if you take other countries which went through this transformation, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, the, and now China, that while inequalities do increase, in the end, what is important is that, that the poor rise above. And so I think we've just got to be patient and not worry. I mean, why should I care how much Mukesh Ambani has? As long as, I mean, the guy represents 7% of India's taxes and 9% of India's exports. And, and so if he does his that and does that for society, I think inequality also we should, you know, learn to kind of, at, the, at this stage, let's focus on growth and Growth is the best tonic for poverty. Thank you, Gurjan Das. I hope sometime in the not very distant future, we'll be sitting together when you've written a book, India with Both Hands Untied. <laughs> <laughs>
if the BJP could become a secular party, I mean, the, the kind of things, the reforms that were done in the Vajpayee government, you know, they triggered off the telecom revolution, the IT revolution, so much. The roads process, the global water access and all. So, I mean, that party, and, they, and frankly, even at the over the Gujarat episode, the anguish that Vajpayee expressed. Um, so, what I'm trying to say is that if that could happen, that would be, there would be hope. And the regional parties, you know, they could have a national purpose of some kind. It would be. But these are hopes, and I'm not sure that the, the populism, the politics of India, even the BJP no longer, I trust them as being a party of economic reform any longer. And so I just don't, there's no party today which is relentlessly telling us that we have to reform the bureaucracy, the police, the judiciary, and the economy. And the answers are all there. But the crux of that is the transition that you've noted in this book from a constitutional democracy to a populist democracy. That's our friend Andre yes. uh, is made, that makes that distinction very well. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it was, it, it's, it's for that reason that I feel that we need a genuine, and I don't think a liberal party is going to go out tomorrow and get power. It doesn't, liberal parties generally don't get power. But what it, the liberal parties do is they put the reform every day on the front page of the newspaper, on the agenda. They have a nuisance value. The way the left has a nuisance value in reminding us about the poor every day. So there is a value to that kind of politics. I think we have some time for some questions, so we'll open it up uh, to the audience. I have a small question. Uh, sir, there is a strong difference about the Lokpal bill uh, in the area whether CBI would be under Lokpal or not. What is your personal opinion? Uh, but this is, a, this is, of course, the crux today <laughs> of the issue, isn't it? Um, my own view actually is that this issue is of secondary importance. What is of greater importance is that once you, once the Lokpal uh, declares somebody to be guilty of a trial, that the judicial system will let us down. It will take us 10, 15 years to convict that person. So I would rather a bigger deterrent to corruption will be uh, fast-tracking corruption. You know, uh, every court. In fact, the very good suggestion made uh, was that, you know, one out of four or five people in parliament has a charge sheet, a criminal charge sheet behind him. If you fast track the criminals in parliament, you'll deter them from entering politics. You know? So that's where I would put my energy, right? But you're right. I mean, this is an important question. And obviously, one wants a CBI that's credible uh, rather than a uh, party sort of CBI. Uh, the gentleman. Mr. Das, uh, I have a question. Uh, when you talk about a strong state and a weak state, uh, I feel that a strong state is a state uh, which has its governance institutions intact, like say US. But when you talk about a weak state, I feel India is a weak state because we have institutional voids. You term China as a strong state, but I, if I I feel that maybe uh, China is also a weak state because even it has its own institutional voids which breeds corruption, which breeds uh, lack of governance. So when we talk about a strong Indian state, then maybe what we need is uh, right institutions taking care of uh, our day-to-day -day requirements and talking about, I mean, big economic reforms maybe uh, is at a later stage what we need at the preliminary stage is basic governance issues which needs to be uh, taken care of. Right. 
Well, you're saying exactly what uh, what I'm I'm arguing for, and why you know why these institutions have got weakened. They got weakened particularly in the Indira Gandhi period. But we gave we you know we've got democracy before capitalism, and we are unique in that way in India. Uh, almost all the countries did it the other way around, except perhaps the United States, which also got its capitalism, capitalist institutions when the Industrial Revolution came. But they got democracy in the late uh, uh, 18th century. The fact is, after we got democracy, so we have sudden populist uh, demands came up. Demand to, re to redistribute. <coughs> Before you had actually created the pie, you were asked to distribute the pie. And then we kept piling on to the government, const I mean, an innumerable num number of Every finance minister in every budget announces 12 new schemes. And the poor bureaucracy, the administration has to administer those things. So we make horrendous demands on the state without increasing the capacity of the state. The issue is state capacity. In fact, this is a problem, Rudamshu, with the discipline of political science. It's very interesting that for the last 100 years, most of the focus of political science has been on accountability, that third pillar, but very little on state capacity, on how do you become an effective state. But we know that there are effective states. I mean, the Scandinavian states are, they have a huge responsibility, social responsibility, but they are also, when it comes to governance, they deliver. But maybe it's more of a I mean, mismatch between the demand and supply in the Indian situation. The demand is so high, we don't have well, the capability to... Yeah, so the question is, I mean, a, 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 a strong liberal state has institutions which can deliver. It has politicians that are able to uh, resist the idea of free booze, free TV sets, free laptops at the time of... And you invest, I mean the amount of money that we have invested in social welfare in the last five, eight years. Imagine if just a part of that had been gone into investing in a, in a modern judiciary, giving computers to all judges, uh, having computers in all SHOs, you know, making our police, a modern police force with forensic skills and so on, we would be far better off. So, this is where I was saying, you know, the parties are determined to give uh, goodies at election time to sections of population. Whereas now this new middle class wants public goods, roads, law and order, education, Hell, these are affect everybody in society. That's all question there. Yeah, please. Okay. Yeah. So during the course of your talk, of your uh, discussion, you made three comments. One was that no one uh, that you still don't know. People don't know which party to vote for. In, 19, in 2014. So that comment is still unanswered because I certainly don't know and the audience also doesn't know. So that that is one void you have left. <coughs> the next thing is you've said that if Manmohan Singh had tried to sell the reforms to the Congress party rather than others, it would have been very beneficial. So the problem is he has not been able to sell it to his coalition partners. They are the ones who are raising the brakes. They are the ones who are stopping everything. Right. It's not the Congress, it's not Rahul Gandhi and Sonia Gandhi, but they are the ones which are causing the problem. And last comment is that you said a liberal state does not mean that the rich automatically gets richer. But I see no wrong. I would suggest to you that there's no problem with the rich getting, rich getting, getting richer. 
so long as that trickle down effect takes place that is the problem that is not happening if the if mukesh ambani gets another 1 billion there is no problem but why he is making that 1 billion if 50000 people are gets job gets jobs and are yeah, still out of the pond so that is okay we we you are echoing actually thank you very much you really in these three points you made you really echoed what i have been uh, trying to express and you actually just reinforce what uh, what 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 i've said very very eloquently yeah you are yes sir uh, so it's been very for a long time can i just get back to you i think is yeah we could actually have some more lights in the yeah. Yeah. auditorium so we can see people go ahead Mr. Das, this is the second time around I'm uh, at a talk by you, and it's always a pleasure. But the first time around, um, uh, when I heard you, you mentioned that there have been times in India's history where India has not grown because of the government; it's grown in spite of it, and that troubled me. So after a while, I ended up uh, quitting my job uh, in consulting in New York and moving to India to work with a non-profit that uh, assists assists parliamentarians. are uh, in providing research and execution at the grassroots at the conference yeah, yes. no it's actually called swanidhi initiative okay and um, we focus not just on research but also on executing on projects that they uh, want to execute on the gra at the grassroots Wonderful. and uh, and you know increasingly i came to understand that one of the fundamental flaws in our structure in our governance structure is the fact that information doesn't seem to reach our parliamentarians in form research doesn't seem to um doesn't seem to reach them which is why they are unable to uh you know execute on anything that they want to do so they cannot afford to hire mckinsey bay and bcg to do it for them and but but the but my question to you is where do you see the role of informed decision making amongst parliamentarians especially you know when you make a liberal case and personally my optimism arises from the fact that given the rise of the internet and social media it will be difficult to constrain that component of information in our parliament right. thank you no i completely agree with that but my worry is that the parliament is not debating is not or is not being allowed to debate is not allowed to debate i mean just a couple of days ago i was in delhi we had the opening of this hindu center for politics and uh, public policy and public policy and the prime was at the uh, inaugurated by uh, pranab bogarty who said exactly that this disruptions uh he said dissent is fine but not disruption and and so uh you you know what you all you said is very good and prs has been doing some of the thing things that you're talking about and uh yeah, certainly anything we can do to influence our legislator is for the good no question about it uh they're a little immune to information uh but uh, what is they been they've actually got shaken up by what's happened in the last few years they don't quite understand you know uh the the case the movement of anna azad and kejriwal and their fire all these things are there they're really shaken up so they're <laughs> It's the right time uh, to do this. Okay. Uh, so we take that last question. I think. Yeah. Sir, a question. In general, in public debate, uh, I do not hear today or about feudalism as an issue. If we look at, if we look across the world, there are probably the USA and Australia and probably Israel. are non feudal societies the whole of europe is feudal china is feudal india is a feudal uh, society if i bring up usa australia and israel as newly established countries correct never had a landed gentry absolutely so non feudal and these countries have managed to possibly outpace all of the other all of the probably the rest of the world in this context where how important how correct 
is the action initiated by VP Singh many years ago, reservations in Mandal, the Mandal and the uh, voice raised by Mayavati, you know, the voice of the downtrodden, of the oppressed. Where does this find place in the larger context of nation building and progress? Well, you know, actually, fight against I, I, feudalism. Yeah, I think, uh, in fact, I think we have done rather well on this score in the last 65 years. I mean, the, the, the Dalits and uh, OBCs and all, I think uh, they, 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 they have, uh, we would have liked to have done more. I mean, as, if you ask me, I'm not, I'm not, I'm a person against all reservations. I'm like Andre, sure. that way. And philosophically, to me, reservations are the wrong way to go about it. But at the same time, the, the, your aspiration uh, is, is the right one. And I just feel that this is an area that that whether you had, uh, you know, what may, may not agree with a lot of things Mayavati may be doing, have done, or Lalu may have done, but the, it, it did give a lot of uh, dignity, uh, and voice. Empowerment. And empowerment. Empowerment. And in fact, to me, the best answer going out of the future is a high rate of growth. High rate of growth, we make, I mean, the Dalit entrepreneurs that are coming up, uh, it's very impressive, that movement. So, that is really the way to think about it. Uh, it's curious, you know, just a few, a week ago, I met a Dalit person. And he was a little, he didn't like my discourse, uh, because he said, what we need is a revolution. And a lot of people, when they talk about India, they use words like Arab Spring, etc., etc. And I, I get very disturbed by that sort of uh, dialogue because I do believe we have come a long way. You know, because I wrote the last book, they've been saying, well, don't we need a Kurukshetra? And I said, absolutely not. Uh, the fact of the matter, you know, this book of mine was, was born actually in Tahrir Square. I was invited by the democracy movement in Egypt. This was a couple of years ago, when it, when it first happened, you know, the movement against Mubarak. And uh, they, 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 the democracy movement asked me to present the India model for the future of Egypt. And, and they asked me three questions. First question was, <laughs> How did you keep the generals out of power? I said, you know, for 65 years, no one has asked that question. <laughs> he says, do you realize how far you have come? He says, that's the aspiration of every third world country, which is, wants to be a democracy or it wants to maintain its democracy. And you've never even asked it. And your neighbors, are full of generals. The second question was, um, they said that 11% of Egypt is Christian, Coptic Christian, and 13.5% of India is Muslim. Now we believe, they said, that the Egyptians that Christians in Egypt feel insecure, whereas the Muslims in India do not feel insecure. Or the Muslims in India are not, are the least radicalized, fundamentalized Muslims in the world. And again I said, you know, I was thinking of Gujarat 2002, Sikh riots 1984, I would have hardly put India in the model. <coughs> but they said, you know, you are too close. You know, if you look from afar, India looks different. The third question they asked was, how did you get the outsourcing business so that we can get some of it too and make Egypt into a fast rising economy? Now these questions make me reflect, make me think less about Egypt but more about India. And I realized that, you know, we have come a long way. And so nobody, one should never talk about a revolution. 
And, and, and therefore, the level of discourse is so important that it be a discourse of reform uh, rather than revolt. And therefore, I worry sometimes about these protests that uh, go on. Shall we uh, take the last question? Okay, last yeah. question. In your talk, you just quoted from Democracy in America, and Tolle, the author, also spoke of something called the tyranny of democracy in the same book. Now, today in India, what we see is we see populism, the populist card played by all parties, be it the central, regional, casteist politics, minority politics, regional satraps. They are playing the cast, this card, and um, it seems to have stalled a lot of decision-making process in the central government. How do you see this panning out in the next 10 years, say, in India? Well, I mean, he, I'm so pleased that somebody has read Tocqueville in this audience. And uh, he did talk about the tyranny of democracy. And democracy has lots of flaws like the... Was the phrase tyranny of the majority or the tyranny of democracy? Yeah, I think it was the tyranny. I'm not sure it was Tocqueville whose phrase was tyranny of the majority. But anyway. The, uh, but he did talk about the downsides of, of democracy and how populism could subvert. And that's why I sometimes worry about the solutions of people like Prashant Bhushan and Kejriwal. They, the good part they talk about is the Mohalla Sabha, the Gram Sabha, to give voice to the people. So if you're going to spend that one hour in your neighborhood, there's a, there's a place like a Bahala Sabha where you can devote your time to. But uh, certainly when they say that every Friday you don't need a parliament, we should have the direct democracy, and everybody has a cell phone, so every Friday you, you, you say yes or no to the bills that are up for, 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 for review. Now that's, that's what is the extreme. Direct democracy is a dangerous thing. Unless, of course, you are in a Greek Polish type thing. Okay. Thank you. I think we are totally out of time. Uh, but let me just finish off by uh, thanking you, uh, Mr. Charan Das, Dr. Mukherjee, uh, as fascinated by the conversation as I'm sure the audience was. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Aspirin Institute and IMI for organizing this. They've been very gracious hosts. And I believe uh, there have been a lot of volunteers for this program, both from IMI, the Aspen Institute, as well as the RP Sanjeev Bhattar Group. So thank you all, uh, volunteer for this program. Uh, as we end today, uh, Mr. Das has uh, graciously agreed to sign uh, books in the atrium outside. So I'll invite you all outside now. Uh, thank you. Thank you.
if the BJP could become a secular party, I mean, the, the kind of things, the reforms that were done in the Vajpayee government, you know, they triggered off the telecom revolution, the IT revolution, so much, the roads process, the road and water and all. So, I mean, that party, and, they, and frankly, even at the go of the Gujarat episode, the anguish that Vajpayee expressed. Um, so, what I'm trying to say is that if that could happen, that would be, there would be hope. And the regional parties, you know, they could have a national purpose of some kind. It would be. But these are hopes, and I'm not sure that the, the populism, the politics of India, even the BJP no longer, I trust them as being a party of economic reform any longer. And so I just don't, there's no party today which is relentlessly telling us that we have to reform the bureaucracy, the police, the judiciary, and the economy. And the answers are all there. But the crux of that is the transition that you have noted in this book from a constitutional democracy to a populist democracy. That's our friend Andre yes. uh, is made that makes that distinction very well. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I mean, it was. It, it's, it's for that reason that I feel that we need a genuine... And I don't think a liberal party is going to go out tomorrow and get power. It doesn't... Liberal parties generally don't get power. But what did the liberal parties do is they put the reform every day on the front page of the newspaper, on the agenda. They have a nuisance value. The way the left has a nuisance value in reminding us about the poor every day. So, there is a value to that kind of politics. I think we have some time for some questions, so we'll open it up uh, to the audience. I have a small question. Uh, sir, there is a strong difference about the Lokpal bill uh, in the area whether CBI would be under Lokpal or not. What is your personal opinion? Uh, but this is, a, this is, of course, the crux today <laughs> of the issue, isn't it? Um, my own view actually is that this issue is of secondary importance. What is of greater importance is that once you, once the Lokpal uh, declares somebody to be guilty of a trial, that the judicial system will let us down. It will take us 10, 15 years to convict that person. So I would rather a bigger deterrent to corruption will be uh, fast-tracking corruption. You know, uh, every court. In fact, the very good suggestion <laughs> made uh, was that, you know, one out of four or five people in parliament has a charge sheet, a criminal charge sheet behind him. If you fast track the criminals in parliament, you'll deter them from entering politics. You know? So that's where I would put my energy, right? But you're right. I mean, this is an important question. And obviously, one wants a CBI that's credible uh, rather than a uh, party sort of CBI. Uh, the gentleman. Mr. Das, uh, I have a question. Uh, when you talk about a strong state and a weak state, uh, I feel that a strong state is a state uh, which has its governance institutions intact, like say US. But when you talk about a weak state, I feel India is a weak state because we have institutional voids. You term China as a strong state, but I, if I, I feel that maybe uh, China is also a weak state because even it has its own institutional voids which breeds corruption, which breeds uh, lack of governance. So when we talk about a strong Indian state, then maybe what we need is uh, right institutions taking care of uh, our day-to-day -day requirements and talking about, I mean, big economic reforms maybe uh, is at a later stage what we need at the preliminary stage is basic governance issues which needs to be uh, taken care of. Right. 
Well, you're saying exactly what uh, what I'm, I'm arguing for. And why, you know, why these institutions have got weakened? They got weakened particularly in the Indira Gandhi period. But we gave, we, you know, we've got democracy before capitalism. And we are unique in that way in India. Uh, almost all the countries did it the other way around, except perhaps the United States, which also got its capitalism, capitalist institutions when the Industrial Revolution came. But they got democracy in the late uh, uh, 18th century. The fact is, after we got democracy, so we have sudden populist uh, demands came up. Demand to, re to redistribute. <coughs> Before you had actually created the pie, you were asked to distribute the pie. And then we kept piling on to the government, const I mean, an innumerable num number of Every finance minister in every budget announces 12 new schemes. And the poor bureaucracy, the administration has to administer those things. So we make horrendous demands on the state without increasing the capacity of the state. The issue is state capacity. In fact, this is a problem, Rudamshu, with the discipline of political science. It's very interesting that for the last 100 years, most of the focus of political science has been on accountability, that third pillar, but very little on state capacity, on how do you become an effective state. But we know that there are effective states. I mean, the Scandinavian states are, they have a huge responsibility, social responsibility, but they are also, when it comes to governance, they deliver. But maybe it's more of a I mean, mismatch between the demand and supply in the Indian situation. The demand is so high, we don't have well, the capability to... Yeah, so the question, I mean, a, 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 a strong liberal state has institutions which can deliver. It has politicians that are able to uh, resist the idea of free booze, free TV sets, free laptops at the time of. And you invest, I mean the amount of money that we have invested in social welfare in the last five, eight years. Imagine if just a part of that had been gone into investing in a, in a modern judiciary, giving computers to all judges, uh, having computers in all SHOs, you know, making our police, a modern police force with forensic skills and so on, we would be far better off. So, this is where I was saying, you know, the parties are determined to give uh, goodies at election time to sections of population. Whereas now, this new middle class wants public goods, roads, law and order, education, well, these are affect everybody in society. I saw a question there. Yeah, please. Okay. Yeah. So during the course of your talk, of your uh, discussion, you made three comments. One was that no one uh, there, you still don't know, people don't know which party to vote for in, 19, in 2014. So that comment is still unanswered because I certainly don't know and the audience also doesn't know. So that that is one void you have left. <coughs> the next thing is you've said that if Manmohan Singh had tried to sell the reforms to the Congress party rather than others, it would have been very beneficial. So the problem is he is not being able to sell it to his coalition partners. They are the ones who are raising the brakes. They are the ones who are stopping everything. It's not the Congress, it's not Rahul Gandhi and Sonia Gandhi, but they are the ones which are causing the problem. And last comment is that you said a liberal state does not mean that the rich automatically gets richer. But I see no wrong. I would suggest to you that there's no problem with the rich getting, rich getting, getting richer. 
so long as that trickle down effect takes place that is the problem that is not happening if the if mukesh ambani gets another 1 billion there is no problem but why he is making that 1 billion if 50000 people are get job get job and are yeah, still out of the box that i need okay we we you're echoing actually thank you very much you really in these three points you made you really echoed what i have been uh, trying to express and you actually just reinforce what uh, what 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 i've said very very eloquently yeah you and yes sir uh, so he's been waiting for a long time can i just get back to you i think he's yeah we could actually have some more lights in the yeah. Yeah. auditorium so we can see people go ahead Mr. Das, this is the second time around I'm uh, at a talk by you, and it's always a pleasure. But the first time around, um, uh, when I heard you, you mentioned that there have been times in India's history where India has not grown because of the government; it's grown in spite of it, and that troubled me. So after a while, I ended up uh, quitting my job uh, in consulting in New York and moving to India to work with a non-profit that uh, assists assists parliamentarians. are uh, in providing research and execution of the grassroots at the conference yes. no it's actually called swanidhi initiative okay and um, we focus not just on research but also on executing on projects that they uh, want to execute on the gra- at the grassroots Wonderful. and uh, wa- and you know increasingly i came to understand that one of the fundamental flaws in our structure in our governance structure is the fact that information doesn't seem to reach our parliamentarians informed research doesn't seem to um doesn't seem to reach them which is why they are unable to uh you know execute on anything that they want to do so they cannot afford to hire mckinsey bay and bcg to do it for them and but but the but my question to you is where do you see the role of informed decision making amongst parliamentarians especially you know when you make a liberal case and personally my optimism arises from the fact that given the rise of the internet and social media it will be difficult to constrain that component of information in a parliament right. thank you no i completely agree with that but my worry is that the parliament is not debating is not or is not being allowed to debate is not allowed to debate i mean just a couple of days ago i was in delhi we had the opening of this hindu center for politics <laughs> and uh, public policy and public policy and the prime it was at the uh, inaugurated by uh, pranab bokerty who said exactly that this disruptions uh he said dissent is fine but not disruption and and so uh you you know what you all you said is very good and prs has been doing some of the thing thing that you're talking about and uh yeah, certainly anything we can do to influence our legislator is for the good no question about it uh they're a little immune to information uh but uh, what is they've been they've actually got shaken up by what's happened in the last few years they don't quite understand you know uh the the case the movement of anna azad and kejriwa that they by all these things that have been they're really shaken up so they're <laughs> It's the right time uh, to do this. Okay. Uh, so let me take that last question. I think. Yeah. Sir, so a question. In general, in public debate, uh, I do not hear today or about feudalism as an issue. If we look at, if we look across the world, there are probably the USA and Australia and probably Israel. are non feudal societies the whole of europe is feudal china is feudal india is a feudal uh, society if i bring up usa australia and israel as newly established countries non feudal land of gentry absolutely so non feudal and these countries have managed to possibly outpace all of the other all of the probably the rest of the world in this context where how important how correct 
is the action initiated by VP Singh many years ago, reservations in Mandal, in the Mandal and the uh, voice raised by Mayavati, you know, the voice of the downtrodden, of the oppressed. Where does this find place in the larger context of nation building and progress? Well, you know, actually, fight against I, I, yeah, I think, uh, in fact, I think we have done rather well on this score in the last 65 years. I mean, the, the, the Dalits and uh, OBCs and all, I think uh, they, 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 they have, uh, we would have liked to have done more. I mean, as, if you ask me, I'm not, in, I'm not, I'm a person against all reservations. I'm like Andre, sure. that way. And philosophically, to me, reservations are the wrong way to go about it. But at the same time, the, the, your aspiration uh, is, is the right one. And I just feel that this is an area that, that whether you had, uh, you know, one may, may not agree with a lot of things Mayavati may be doing, have done, or Lalu may have done, but the, it, it did give a lot of uh, dignity, uh, voice. Empowerment. And? Empowerment. Empowerment. And in fact, to me, the best answer going out in the future is a high rate of growth. High rate of growth, we make, I mean, the Dalit entrepreneurs that are coming up, uh, it's very impressive, that movement. So, that is really the way to think about it. Uh, it's curious, you know, just a few, a week ago, I met a Dalit person. And he was a little, he didn't like my discourse, uh, because he said, what we need is a revolution. And a lot of people, when they talk about India, they use words like Arab Spring, etc., etc. And I, I get very disturbed by that sort of uh, dialogue because I do believe we have come a long way. You know, because I wrote the last book, they've been saying, well, don't we need a Kurukshetra? And I said, absolutely not. Uh, the fact of the matter, you know, this book of mine was, was born actually in Tahrir Square. I was invited by the democracy movement in Egypt. This was a couple of years ago, when, when it first happened, you know, the movement against Mubarak. And uh, they, 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 the democracy movement asked me to present the India model for the future of Egypt. And, and they asked me three questions. First question was, <laughs> How did you keep the generals out of power? I said, you know, for 65 years, no one has asked that question. <laughs> he says, do you realize how far you have come? He says, that's the aspiration of every third world country, which is, wants to be democracy or it wants to maintain its democracy. And you've never even asked it. And your neighbors, are full of generals. The second question was, um, they said that 11% of Egypt is Christian, Coptic Christian, and 13.5% of India is Muslim. Now, we believe, they said, that the Egyptians that Christians in Egypt feel insecure, whereas the Muslims in India do not feel insecure. Or the Muslims in India are not, are the least radicalized, fundamentalized Muslims in the world. And again I said, you know, I was thinking of Gujarat 2002, Sikh riots 1984, I would have hardly put India in the model. <coughs> but they said, you know, you are too close. You if you look from afar, India looks different. The third question they asked was, how did you get that outsourcing business so that we can get some of it too and make Egypt into a fast rising economy? Now these questions make me reflect, make me think less about Egypt but more about India. And I realized that, you know, we have come a long way. And so nobody, one should never talk about a revolution. 
And, and, and therefore, the level of discourse is so important that it be a discourse of reform uh, rather than revolt. Therefore, I worry sometimes about these protests that uh, go on. Shall we uh, take the last question? Okay, last yeah. question. In your talk, you just quoted from Democracy in America. I'm told the author also spoke of something called the tyranny of democracy in the same book. Now, today in India, what we see is we see populism, the populist card played by all parties, be it the central, regional, casteist politics, minority politics, regional satraps. They're playing the cast this card, and um, it seems to have stalled a lot of decision making process in the central government. How do you see this panning out in the next 10 years, say, in India? Well, I mean, he, I'm so pleased that somebody has read your quill in this audience. And uh, he did talk about tyranny of democracy. And democracy has lots of flaws like these. Was the phrase tyranny of the majority or the tyranny of democracy? Yeah, I think it was a tyranny. I'm not sure it was Tocqueville whose phrase was tyranny of the majority. But anyway. The, uh, but he did talk about the downsides of, of democracy and how populism could subvert. And that's why I sometimes worry about the solutions of people like Prashant Bhushan and Kejriwal. They, the good part they talk about is the Mohalla Sabha, the Gram Sabha, to give voice to the people. So if you're going to spend that one hour in your neighborhood, there's a, there's a place like a Mohalla Sabha where you can devote your time to. But uh, certainly when they say that every Friday you don't need a parliament, you should have a direct democracy, and everybody has a cell phone, so every Friday you, you, you say yes or no to the bills that are up for, 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 for review. Now that's, that's what the extreme. Direct democracy is a dangerous thing. Unless, of course, you are in a Greek Polish Greek Polish. Thank you. I think we are totally out of time. Uh, but let me just finish off by uh, thanking you, uh, Dr. Charandas, Dr. Mukherjee, uh, as fascinated by the conversation as I'm sure the audience was. I'd uh, also like to thank the Aspen Institute and IMI for organizing this. They've been very gracious hosts. And I believe uh, there have been a lot of volunteers for this program, both from IMI, the Aspen Institute, as well as the RP Sanjeev Pointer Group. So thank you all who uh, volunteered for this program. Uh, as we end today, uh, Sadas has uh, graciously agreed to sign uh, books in the atrium outside. So I'll invite you all outside now. Uh, thank you. Thank you.